start the uh, special Monday, November 15th uh, town board workshop. And we're doing it on Monday because uh, the second and fourth Thursday of November, when we usually do our town board workshops, well, the second Thursday was Veterans Day. And the third Thursday is Thanksgiving, so we weren't going to have workshops on those days. And there's enough conversation pieces that we needed to have a workshop in November, so we made a special one for uh, tonight. We have uh, an interesting agenda tonight of presentations and discussions. Um, the first one up is a presentation by Ken Gre Gregory from Bad, is it Distro or Distro? Uh, well, actually, No Wave is our, is our main entity. No Wave, facility. all right. And this is regarding the 2022 New York State law on marijuana stores in a municipality. Um, and I want to just make something um, before you get into it, Ken. Um, a couple months ago, I see Janine Sanger here. Uh, Janine came in from uh, WEN, Webster uh, Health Network. And you also had Lexi in from the American Lung Association. And I'm going to say that that was a presentation to the town board on the con of the town uh, staying in in 2022. Ken, I'm going to assume that tonight is the counterpoint to that, the pro uh, of why the town should Absolutely, stay in. yeah. Okay. Town board decisions, it's incumbent on the town board to look at both the pros and cons of something like this. And that's why we are having both sides present at these workshops. And I just want to make sure everybody understands tonight that this is not a public hearing. So there is no chance for the public to get on the podium and give opine on their opinion on this. Is there something coming at some point? Uh, that will come at some point. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out. If anybody was uh, here thinking that I want to give my two cents on this, that, that would come in the future. And since the year is only about 45 days from being done, the town board is going to have to decide uh, by the end of the year if we are opting out for 2022. Or if we are, Charlie, I think it's a default opt-in. Correct. Um, but even in a default opt-in, the town board would probably be making some local law resolution on where and how many of these. I think it would be the prudent thing yeah. to do, yeah. Well, that was a long preface, wasn't it, Bill? That's usual. Yeah, well, that's my, you know, it's my charm. So. I'm right. not going to so, short you on your 15 minutes, all right? I talk fast. I talk fast. So, all right. I'm Ken Gregory, uh, born off Dickinson Road here in Webster. Currently live with my wife and two kids off Gravel Road, uh, 13 and 11. Um, I actually brought my partner, Brian Lane, as well. Um, we actually are owners of No Wave. We're currently a hemp processing facility. We're the only licensed uh, hemp processor in Monroe County. Um, we're actually breaking ground on a new facility. Uh, Wednesday, actually, we have a ceremony coming up. Uh, Thursday. So I um, just kind of want to give you a little bit of background uh, by us. We are not pursuing a retail location in Webster. Um, I'm not interested in that at all. I don't want to do retail. We're not going to be operating our business out of Webster. I'm here as a taxpayer and resident. Just want to be clear on that. Um, really, honestly, what came here is, is uh, I love seeing Tom's uh, kind of updates on the supervisor columns. You know, kind of got a little scared seeing some of the increase in taxes and kind of some of the language being used. So I wanted to make sure that you guys understood what recreational marijuana could potentially mean uh, for, uh, for this area. And I just want to be clear here. You guys, your guys' decision is not whether or not to allow marijuana in, uh, in Webster. It's coming regardless of whether you opt in or opt out. Um, home grow is going to be allowed. The transfer of marijuana between people is going to be allowed. Up to three ounces of possession is going to be allowed. So the decision really is to allow tax revenue and retail locations. That's what you're being asked to do at this time. Um, I apologize. I was not at the, the, the con presentation, um, but I did speak to Tom a little bit about but the potential revenue this could generate, and I want to make sure you guys had an accurate picture of that. Um, so if we looked at Colorado, they actually went with legalization back in 2014. Much different time in terms of cannabis across the United States, not just in Colorado. Every year it's beginning to become more and more acceptable. 
and I think it's important to use current accurate numbers uh, as regards to what's being generated. So um, you can see, you know, 2020, uh, you're, you're just a little bit over $2 billion in revenue was generated uh, in terms of the uh, sale of recreational marijuana on pace to absolutely destroy that for this year. And that trend line could not be more clear. It's growing every year. Um, so I, I basically just took a pure resident per resident generation figure to kind of get a rough estimate. I think that's the fairest way to do it. If per resident Colorado is generating uh, $391, we can get a rough idea of what that could mean for residents of Webster. Um, my figures, I'm looking at roughly 3%, uh, $537, 3% of the sale in Webster would go towards the town. Right, so you're, let's say you have a $100 sale at the register, you guys are making $3 right over the town every single time. If you guys opt out, someone can actually deliver that to the town of Webster, you don't get paid, Rondecoit get paid, Penfield gets paid, another municipality would. Does that make sense, everybody? Any questions on that? Real simple math here, pretty basic. Um, it turned, again, was not here for, for the, uh, the American Lung Association. I'm assuming you guys talked uh, some of the pulmonary illnesses back in 2019. Show of hands, who remembers when vaping was killing everybody back in 2019? Anybody remember that? Huge e-cigarette scare back in the day. A um, couple years has passed since that point in time, and we've actually seen high levels of vitamin E acetate and associated with black market vaping products for recreational marijuana. Um, it was a massive issue. Uh, a lot of confusion, a lot of unknowns at this, you know, back in 2019. Um, in terms of the actual lab testing, it's going to be key to preventing these types of products in terms of getting to the hands of users. Um, the medical marijuana program in New York State does not allow for vitamin E acetate to be added into these products. And just kind of simplify that for you guys. Um, vitamin E acetate is actually a cut that is added to vaping marijuana so the drug dealers can make more money. Um, it's, it's, it's a tale as old as time when it comes to dealing drugs, right? If they're cutting the product, they make more money. Significant harm can be done to an individual, individual user. It's actually a fatty oil that gets vaporized and re-solidifies inside of their lungs. Um, absolutely devastating. There was a, uh, a huge issue back in 2019 with it. Uh, they actually arrested two brothers out of Kenosha that were largely to believe to be kind of the uh, the source of this, if you will. Um, they had 98,000 unfilled cartridges, 32,000 ready to go. They were selling these all across their country. Um, actually, their mom was the one that ratted on them and, and, and made sure this, this stopped. But uh, we haven't seen as big, uh, but it's, it's, it's an absolute problem that the recreational program does solve. Uh, you know, you can't recall the products from a drug dealer, but if they're, you know, with the actual recreational marijuana program in New York State, it does mandate a third party test these products to identify that this substance isn't in it. And at any point in time, you can request that the product be taken to be tested on top of it. Um, just an update on today on these pulmonary illnesses. Um, laboratory tests do show vitamin E acetate and some THC cartridges or vaping is strongly linked to the Avali outbreak. Um, both the CDC and the FDA are concurring this. And they, the CDC and the FDA are recommending that uh, people don't use THC containing products from informal sources. They want these from a regulated, tested, um, licensed entity to be able to solve for some of these. And that's pretty strong language from both the CDC and the FDA to avoid the black market as much as possible. I would love to see Webster take the same standpoint, buy these safe products from a licensed, regulated, lab uh, tested dealer who's going to be generating 3% of the overall Webster budget. Seems like a no brainer to me. Um, in terms of the actual law, like I mentioned before, the lab testing is listed right in the law. It's as clear as can be. You can't even test these yourself and claim the company manufacturing it that, you know, oh, yeah, it's not in there. We didn't put vitamin D acetate in there. Um, they actually have to send it to a third party. The third party, completely on their own, has to, has to have it. Most of the products you do see on the market have a QR scanner right on there. You can pop your phone on there, pulls up the lab test for that batch, shows you what's in it. Um, any thoughts on that, Brian? Yeah, with, uh, with the way that they're going to make work. We're a GMP certified facility, which means we can sell products uh, in pharmacies across the country. They require every piece of documentation from how we wash our mop heads to what goes in the products. You take one of our products as a serial number, and it will be the same through the THC market. Uh, everything will be track and trace. So they're actually going to put serial numbers on plants and track that process all the way through to final product creation. And then you will be required to do small batch testing as well as large batch testing at third party. Um, if, if, 
Webster right now, just so everybody knows, black market's already here. People are already making it in their kitchens. Uh, if you look at the small pop-ups that have been happening around the county, um, people say there's a certain amount of quality, quantities of, of these cannabinoids in these products. Um, and I'll tell you very clearly that they don't match what the people are saying when they make stuff in their homes. It is very difficult. We do it at our facility for CBD products. It's taken us two years to perfect. And people in their homes, they're making things that cause the issues that are happening on the streets. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we actually staff uh, an internal uh, chemist, and we have testing in our own facility. We do it ahead of time before sending it to, the, to, to a third party just to, just to be uh, safe on it. But again, the biggest thing here is that the local drug deal on the corner, if he is selling a product that is tainted, that is hurting people, you can't recall it. You can't identify it. You can't, you know, let, you know, a notice and get out to the consumers to not use that product. So, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see the additional revenue generation as well as some of that risk mitigation from a health standpoint. Seems like a layup. Um, in terms of the gray, uh, the gray area, so let's say, um, you know, as, as Tom had said before, that he was, you know, leaning towards opting out. Um, you know, in that situation, Webster essentially is forfeiting that 3% revenue that could be generated for the entire budget. Gone. Not going to happen. Um, there's already local uh, businesses with the intention of delivering product to areas around Monroe County once they get their license, which is essentially just going to circumvent everything you think from a moral or a health perspective um, you're doing by opting out. Literally just going to be costing Webster money. Um, when we talk about going for a license in terms of a retail license, right? We're expecting, what do you think? About a year from now, license application begins? I would say uh, I was at a session this weekend with a lot of the legislators that are right. I was at a weekend event down in New York City where they actually had the legislators talking to all of us uh, as CBD processors and growers, as well as actually black market dealers across the state. They brought to a conference to discuss what the actual market is out there and help with these regulations. Um, so I would say right now, it looks like from the minute the first regulations are out, it is a minimum of fifth, five months just through legislation. Uh, so we're looking probably at late 2022 or early 2023 for the licensing to be out to everybody. Just so so let's, let's call it late 2022, right? Webster decides to opt out by the end of the year. The state's really setting you guys up for a horrible decision. This is not your fault, just for the record. So let's say the state says you got till the end of this year to opt out, right? You opt out. Any person applying for a retail license will not put Webster down because you've opted out. Two years from now, if you want to go back and opt in and think, you know what, we really missed out. Aranda Coit's just banging out, absolutely crushing revenue. Um, we can do what we want as a municipality. If at that point you decide to opt into it, there may be no additional license given out at that point in time. And I can guarantee no one will put down a application for Webster uh, if they're opted out. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. You're going to dedicate your resource and your planning to a municipality that's going to allow that business to be there in the first place. Um, the, the transfer to person to person is massive. We're already seeing shops, uh, you know, selling T-shirts uh, and, and gifting marijuana on the side. There's been some pushback by the, you know, the, the cannabis management board, but until it plays out in the in the courts, um, in terms of gifting marijuana or transferring it, um, there is a loophole that is there currently that's going to be a problem for a municipality that opts out. Um, let's see here. And again, the, the, the possession for up to three ounces at a time. I, I don't know if any of you are, are, are cannabis users here today, but uh, three ounces of marijuana, that's a decent amount. Um, that is substantial for an individual to be able to possess at any point in time. And if Webster, again, does opt out, it does not change that they're allowed to possess that either on their person at any point in time within Webster. To summarize where we are, you know, roughly conservatively 2.75% of the overall budget is what we're looking at. And that's based on the projected Colorado revenue produced this year. It doesn't include next year, the following year, 10 years from now. At this point, you're essentially at the end of prohibition on alcohol. The market has the potential for that type of revenue generation. Uh, just want to be clear on that. Uh, the License applications with the ability to actually generate in the future, it's easy to say now, well, we can just opt back in down the road, but in practice, it doesn't work like that. And uh, a lab tested product with specific ingredients limiting the risks of the black market, I mean, you're doing this, you're, you're very rarely from a politician's standpoint, do you have the opportunity to generate revenue for your citizens as well as protect them at the same point in time? Um, any questions? You do talk fast, Kevin. I definitely talk fast. I want to make sure you had time to ask, Tom. I couldn't write as fast as you were talking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... You think he's Joe Herbst's uh, son from a... 
No, I'd love, if there's questions from at least the, the prior presentation, um, you know, of some of the cons of these, I, I'd love to hear them out. I mean, if there's, you know, a reservation of holding up, your decision isn't a moral aspect on whether or not, you know, individuals should be using marijuana. You guys are being asked by the state to decide if you want to generate that revenue with a retail storefront in the area. That's ultimately what the decision is. I want to be clear on that. And just remember, too, when you're talking about opting in or out, you're talking about smoking lounges. Uh, so if you decide you want to, for instance, uh, take smoking out of public parks, uh, now all you're going to do is create people that are going to have parties at their houses, THC parties. Uh, they're going to have edibles. They're going to have smokes. You're going to have, you're going to have these events happening within Webster. Would you like to have it in a more controlled setting? Uh, also, security. Our facility that we're building, we just uh, broke ground on a $4 million facility, uh, like we said, behind the airport. Uh, we have to have fencing around that facility. We have to have armed security in that facility if we get a THC license. We have to have 24-hour closed captioning. That's the same thing for your dispensaries. <coughs> so your dispensaries, if they come in your town, are basically going to be set up like your banks. Same security measures and everything. You're going to have the exact same security measures that a dispensary required by the state as you do every bank you have in your town. Um, and to be, at, I'm going to be very frank with everybody. Um, I'm a big fish fan, and I don't know if anybody knows about that scene very often, but I'm going to lay out something very clearly for you. Um, if, if you go to a concert, to a fish concert, and you ask the security guards, and you ask the people that are handing out food and drinks what their favorite people to come into town is, it's fish because it's a psychedelic, and it's a lot of people who enjoy cannabis primarily and not many, much alcohol. Uh, you ask them about any country band or any other band that comes into that facility, and they're pretty miserable. Um, let me put it in perspective for you. Um, the cannabis, the smoking lounges will be a better place than the bars in your town eventually as far as you know, the, the environment you'll create around it. I think I just want to make sure that's a, a very good put in perspective for you. I appreciate that, Brian, and your fish advocacy. But uh, at this point in time, the, we are talking about whether or not we're going to allow recreational uh, dispensaries at this point. Yeah. Um, Got to be some questions, guys. Got to be something. The only question I have is... Uh, you know, well, first comment, uh, Mayor Byerts from the village and myself toured your facility mm -hmm. on Paul Road down near the airport. Yep. It's very impressive. I mean, having audited businesses back years ago, it is, it's, it's legit. I mean, it is very impressive, the manufacturing, uh, you know, how you, you bring in product, how you process the product, your shipping, all of that stuff. It's, it's, it's impressive, and I know that you know, I think you're building the new one out in Dave Dunning's town. Is that correct? Yeah, you yeah. Know? I think he's so, coming out th Thursday is the uh, um, groundbreaking on it. So that's my comment. And once again, within the, within the due diligence, uh, I thought it appropriate that I should go out and, and see uh, that facility. And Ken, you reached out to me after you read my article a couple months ago where I said, Without prejudice to moral or ethical or all that, I, I said at that time, my gut tells me back then it was to opt out. Um, I've done due diligence since then. We're coming down to the end of this where the town board's got to make a decision. The village, I think, is set for public hearing and voting to opt out. Um, I don't know what they did as far as presentations from Janine, did they? Did they have a presentation from you? No, no. Okay. And they're a separate municipality. They can choose their means of due diligence leading up to what they're doing. Um, I'm being redundant. We chose the option of the pro and the con. We went con first, pro second. Uh, Charlie, I would assume um, it might be as early as Thursday at the board meeting that we'll... Uh, Thursday the 18th, mm -hmm. maybe advertised for the public hearing on uh, December 2nd. Yeah, that's public. Right, that would be public hearing for local law. That's correct. You know, yeah. and that's as early, I think, as we could do. The funny thing is that's the early we, earliest we could do, probably December 2nd. And then the latest we could do is December 16th. Mm -hmm. Because then we're out of board meetings. Unless, well, unless, unless we, we do a special. A special. Right, yeah. correct. So um, stay tuned, everybody. Um, yep, we'll Tom, I, I, I appreciate you being open-minded on this. You know, I know the easy decision on this is just say, you know what, we don't want that in Webster, but, you know, unfortunately, you guys are being set up by the state. So I hope you take it seriously. I hope you understand where they're trying to angle this, and uh, hopefully the taxes don't get raised. I appreciate it, guys. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Um, and he did it all in 15 minutes. Um,
the next one is going to catch us up on time, believe it or not, Bill, and you know why? Because uh, Bruce Pilato, who would uh, have been here to do the presentation for the Webster Today uh, results from 2021, um, and you guys know that Bruce is Pilato uh, Entertainment. I always get his company name wrong. I called it Pilato Industries, but it's Pilato Entertainment, right? Um, and as you guys have gotten to know Bruce over the last year and a half since he started producing and layouts and all that on the Webster Today, he also manages some rock bands. Asia, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And believe it, believe it or not, that guy, and we're not going to say how old Bruce is, he's on tour right now. Said he's watching from the tour bus, the FaceTime or Facebook Live, um, and I said, "Well, I'll try to do a uh, a good uh, uh, replacement for you for this presentation." But this is really, and I know the board has already gotten this. It's I think seven pages long. You got it a couple days ago. We'll zip through it. I don't know who's got the clicker, but really. Um, the reason why we wanted to do this presentation, and like I said, Bruce, uh, he said he would have done it by Zoom, this and that. I said, you know what, it, it would have been different if you were pitching the board like you did last year on doing the Webster today. This is different. Now we have five editions under our belt. The board, the community now has a, an understanding of what this product looks like. And the, the board and the community also has an understanding of how uh, we did four editions of the Webster Today in 2021, where in the past the Town Times, which was, which was its predecessor to the Webster Today, did three editions. Uh, the four editions in 2021 of the Webster Today came in under budget. Correct, Paul? This is correct, Tom. Okay. I don't know, my math, doing four for under $42,000 in the budget is better than doing three of the town times at $42,000 in the budget. So I told Bruce, and who does have the clicker? <laughs> Go to the next one. Okay. Um, like I said, the board has seen this. I know that this was uh, put up on our website and on uh, social media uh, 24, 48 hours ago for the community to see, just kind of uh, gives a, a basically an overview of where we were and what we've done in the last year plus on this. Um, does this ring some memories, Bill? Remember when Bruce came in here and Yeah, I've gone this through this on? already. So I know you have, yeah. So keep going, keep going right? yeah. I should have had you present. Next time we will. Um, so anyway... Uh, this just goes through um, really what transpired this year, um, the reception that we've had on it has been outstanding. Uh, people seem to like um, the format of it and um, really, and I don't know if we have this right now on the Thursday the 18th agenda, but we're dovetailing toward awarding them, uh, awarding Pilato the contract to do this in 2022. Paul and I have worked with Bruce. He understands what the 2022 proposed budget was. He now knows that the 2022 <coughs> budget was adopted on November 4th. And the line item, I think, for the Webster Today Town Times is, what is it, Paul? $43,000. $43,000. Now, you know, it's, what is it, Missouri, the show me state? <laughs> in 2021, Bruce and his team performed. They came in under budget, and they got us four additions. I know that we have talked with Paul and myself and Chris Bilo uh, that this year we'd like to see if we can move to five and maybe even six editions. But that's going to stay within the budget of $43,000. Um, so that's pretty much 
you can zip through it because there's not a lot of visuals on this. This is all text and verbiage that I'm assuming because the board has had this uh, ahead of time and because it is out there on the website, people can read this at their leisure. Um, I'll open it up right now. Um, oh, one last thing. Chris Bilo <laughs> has graciously accepted to be the point person at the town for the 2022 Webster today. And I think that's a really good thing because there was a little ambiguity on that, Paul, in 2021. And we tended to run right up to the end of production deadlines and all that because there really wasn't somebody that was overtly assigned as the point person. And I think some people thought, because I was a supervisor, well, it's Tom by default. You do not want me in charge of this. So Chris, who runs a tight ship, um, he'll be running it. And I think myself and Kim in my office will be delegated to go and get content. Get as much content and have a bank of content. Because to do five or six editions, one of the things that we run into problems with is can you have enough content to do five or six editions? And uh, Barry, I know you're shaking your head. You, you used to have to write for the, um, for the highway department when there was three town times. I think at one time we had four. I don't know that. They may have included the uh, edition that came out early each year. It was the, uh, what the Webster Herald called it. The, oh, yeah, the progress edition. The progress the edition. Okay. So I think that made it four. I think one of the ways that you can make sure there's enough pertinent content for the readers, which is the, you know, 20,000 people plus in Webster get this at their house, mm -hmm. USPS mailed to them, is that you, we've already shown this year that we have migrated outside of just giving department head uh, updates. And for instance, I just was talking today with somebody who uh, is instrumental at the cemetery on the corner of Woodhall there, Woodhall and 250. And they're doing a big celebration in July because um, they have, uh, believe it or not, they have uh, Revolutionary War veterans buried in that cemetery. Hmm. Who knew? So um, we are getting them to write. I thought that was the one on the ridge. Well, they might have it too. Hmm. But, uh, but the one on Woodhall and 250, um, they're going to write an article, pictures, this and that. Now, whether that article goes in the January edition or the March edition or the May edition, this is the nice thing about having content that is outside of the town government um, department heads, but content that would interest the citizens of Webster. So anyway, does the board have any questions, comments about? I have a, I have a comment and a question. I think what is being put out is fantastic. Every time I get it in my house, take the time to read it. It's a very, very high quality product. Um, obviously we're getting more for our money according to the budget. My question to Paul is from a purchasing standpoint, are we in line with town policy with respect to awarding a contract without competitive bidding? I think we are. I mean, uh, the service that Bruce provides is basically a professional service mm -hmm. because he's, yep. it's more than just printing. He's coordinating the printing, he's coordinating the acquiring the advertisers, uh, he's doing the layout. So I think it, it takes a step beyond just straight printing. Thank you. So in my opinion, it's professional service, which doesn't necessarily have to be bid. Well, there's a level of creativity here that you yes. can't really bid out. Right. It's, that's, what, that's where my concern would well, be in terms, of, <clears throat> yeah. in terms of doing it. And uh, it's, uh, it's not your typical public service or, or right. Uh, Purchase, I, I, I totally agree. I just wanted to ask yeah. the question so that if, mm -hmm. if there are people, residents in the town, that, that are concerned with respect to that, um, that we, we put that information out there. It, it's a great question, John, and a little backdrop to that is that um, even though it's a professional service, you mm -hmm. know, I always think it's 
good to get a couple of bids and something. To your point, Charlie, the creativity makes it very subjective to figure out who is, you know, it's not a low bid thing because that low bid could just be terrible at this, right? Oh, yeah. Um, but the other thing that came up is that uh, Barry Howard uh, at the Webster Chamber of Commerce, he and I talked about this and I said, Bar Barry, the challenge we would have in bidding this is that is there any firms out there, and I'm sure there is, that really do the bundled services. This is what this is. Um, and I think the convolution of this is, is that the town times in the past had one uh, service that was done, and that was printing. Mm -hmm. Which, and I, I don't mean to put down printers, it's a commodity. Okay? Printing is a commodity. Creativity, layout, all of that is where that, that, that comes in. Um, in fact, I was told when I became supervisor, I said, how does the town times work? And, and this is a bit of a paraphrase, uh, the supervisor and his secretary, or his or her secretary, go and get articles, thousand word articles from the department heads. They put them all together and they send them to the printer. <clears throat> and I said, okay. Well, that's, the printer was not tasked with any creativity, nor should they have been. A printer is basically given what camera ready to print. For us to go and bid this, to go and get an advertising agency, to go get a printer, to go get creative layout people. I think during the last couple of months we've met a creative person by the name of Chris Garvin. Um, you would have to go and get like three or four or five different providers and then the town would really be tasked with overseeing all of those providers to try to get them all to work together cohesively in about a two-month process because if we're going to do them six times a year. And i got to tell you something, that does not sound appealing to me. The old one throat to choke, which we've been hearing lately, you get a bundled services uh, company that is going to handle all of that, I don't want to be talking to, to the printer about their time frames and making sure it gets in the mail on time. I don't want to be talking to the layout person while all of a sudden it's got double uh, you know, printing or is missing something. I want to be talking to the company that we hired to oversee all of that. And that's a very different thing. And even Barry Howard said, geez, you know, that's a, there's not a lot of those companies, and certainly there isn't any that are based in Webster, because, John, I know that's been a big right. thing that's put out there, is that we're not using a Webster company. That's fake news. Pilato Entertainment is based out of Webster. So, um, anyway, jeez, Bill, and I went over my time. Yes, you did. Not surprised. <laughs> question. I second that, Bill. Oh, God. Uh, question. Um, well, I'm too very pleased with the, uh, the publication. I've heard nothing but rave reviews on it across the board. Um, we talk about the cost of or the, the cost of publication and the revenue from the advertising that we're supposed to get 65 35 mm -hmm. and I've never seen a number two things and I'll hand the baton to you in a second uh, when we did the contract last year within the uh, contract terms uh, is the 65 35 split on the revenue that they go out and get the town gets 65 percent and it's as a credit against the bill and Paul is able to take their rate sheet that they have, which is in the contract, too. It's all right there. I just haven't right. seen it. And yeah. I'll, I'll hand the baton to Paul. Is it, It's pretty easy for you to tick and tie. Yeah, no, that's correct. Uh, the revenue is paid directly to Pilato Entertainment by the advertisers. He contracts with the advertisers. And then he just simply gives us a 65% credit off the bill. We don't collect the revenue. We don't see the revenue. It's between he and the advertisers. Okay. He has to make sure it's collected before we go to print. Otherwise, you know, he could get yeah. shorted. And okay. he, that, so, he takes on that risk. So we won't, we won't ever see the number? No. Well, it, we will. We get the invoice. It shows the gross expense, and that nets out our 65% revenue. We pay the net. Okay. Yeah. It, Barry, another way to put it is here's the rate sheet that they have. No, One I, page, I understand you know, exactly yeah. what he's saying. And no. If they sell five pages of full page ads and that's all that's in there and it's a thousand dollars a page, I'm, I don't know, then they just sold five thousand dollars of ads. 
65 percent of that is credited uh, to thirty-five hundred dollars or something yeah i understand and he gets a bill for the production of the thing with the 35 what is it 3750 look at you yeah. good at math it's a relatively easy ticking and tying in the finance department to make sure that they're okay. honoring the 2750. deal okay yeah so um to be a cynic i guess do they take that rate sheet that they have out there and they send to everybody and they're saying wink wink you know I'm, it's a thousand bucks a page and i don't know if that but but we're going to charge you two thousand dollars that would seem odd to me. Well, when, when we discussed this, we talked about the fact that this was going to cost this much, and this much was going to be, and it was going to be offset by this much revenue. Um, it inferred that we would be getting monies to us. Instead, we're getting credits. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Barry, I'm glad you went down this line road because, it, and it's funny, I, I think that. Um, one of the key people on Bruce's team is a gentleman by the name of Harry Levenstein. And he, because of his background, and Paul, you're in these meetings. Yes. There is a real science and art to the fact that you can't have a 32-page Webster today and have 30 pages of advertising. But it's not... A flat number. It's not like, well, we can only have like 20% of the, the production be advertising space because it kind of, Paul, I'm not articulating this correct. No, you don't have to go no, any further. I'm just, I was yeah. just making a statement that I, I had a different view of, of what was going to happen. And if eventually they got enough advertisement, that it would almost totally offset the cost of the production. The, yeah. the only I was, way I, that, that was, could that's, happen, Barry? That's, that's, where, that's where I was headed. It, now, it I'm not could. disappointed in the way it's happening mm -hmm. because I think we're getting a great product uh, for what we've always spent. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy with it. Um, well, and I don't want to, you know what? And we'll you don't get, need to go any further. No, I will say the, the way that that could happen is if we all of a sudden produce a 70-page production. Well, and we're not going to do that. I don't think we'll ever do that. And I have, I have concerns. I know one of your concerns is about getting information out to the public, and it's a good one. So maybe six of these would be even better. Um, I question content. Yeah. Oh, I Whether you're going to have enough of it. That's going to be um, the big challenge. Uh, for me personally, four, four was perfect because it was a seasonal thing. Yeah. I also think that you can it, it could possibly become so frequent that then it becomes irrelevant in people's mailboxes I, I think we have to walk that line very carefully we do and I mean the size of it and that's why I say an art and a science of this is you know every action has a reaction things mm -hmm. work in inverse uh, relationships you can't have the thing too big you can't have it go out weekly um, content wise as you know Patty you know <laughs> Now we've heard from the senior citizens in town that they don't use the computer, a lot of them, so we're like, okay, we're going to need to get more stuff in front of them through the U.S. mail, um, but we got to know our limitations. The Webster today, I don't, even, I don't know if we'll get to six this year. Um, I, I like quarterly. You know, I do too. So we'll see. That is okay. a uh, work in progress, but their main compass point is the budget. Okay. And they they I gotta say, Paul, they've been very good. They they they, have. they know that, you know, look, don't put us in a position where we're going over that annual nope. budget. Okay. They're on top of their game. So next. All right. Well, Connor, did we hold you up? No problem. Hey, we have Connor Kimball here from Enterprise Fleet Management. He spoke to us a few weeks ago. Uh, the town's been you. considering leasing some of their passenger vehicles whereas historically we had purchased them outright so he's going to add a little more color to it tonight because we're getting closer to making a decision so there's how many pages and i think that bill and i were both not here at October. Yeah. next time you guys for chocolate very different would be great um, i did see it by facebook live from where i was at and so that's why I know that Connor's presentation on October 14th at the workshop, which was very good, by the way, uh, was more of a 10,000 feet, 
10 year, 800 some odd thousand dollar savings. And over the last couple of weeks, one for Paul. Um, Paul and the department heads and myself have been um, kind of getting granular on uh, if we're going to do this. And I think, Connor, you had mentioned you. it on, on the October 14th. What is this right here? It's, a, it's another one. There's pick. There's oh, just? No, there, no, there's one each of these. Oh, uh, for, okay. For each of the people. Um, when Connor was here on the 14th of October, looking at our fleet right now of cars and pickup trucks between, I think, Parks and Rec, sure. um, the uh, engineering answer. department, the uh, community development department, highway and sewer, I think there were 37 Correct. Yep. cars and pickup trucks, not your big boys, they're very, you know, they're the humongous ones at the highway department, the plows and all that. Um, and so you were talking in that global one on, on October 14th, of, right. you don't just jump into this and take all 37 in your fleet and get rid of them and lease 37. You, you, you okay. ease your way in. And so that's what we've been working on the last month is Connor and an associate of his, Jimmy, yep. have uh, given us some different spreadsheets of, uh, and they started it based on age and mileage, which is a logical thing to get the oldest and the heaviest mile cars and trucks out first and start the leasing that way. The department heads looked at that proposed list and said, no, nah, that's not what I want. That's a good one. I want to keep that one, this and that. And we gave them some latitude on this, I'd say, Paul. Correct. And that led to tonight. Here we are. <laughs> um, I did want to give you the fleet synopsis to pack here, just as reference for the program as a whole. I know we touched base on that. So if any questions come up, I'll be happy to dive into that in more detail. But I do want to spend our time and our focus on the updated, uh, the larger sheet that I blew up as much as I could for you guys. Um, sorry if it's a little tough to see here, but as Tom alluded to, we, get, we got to work with the department heads, um, Tom himself and Paul, and really crunch the numbers on what each department needs from a replacement standpoint. I dove into what's available from a 2022 order standpoint and when, what the time frame would be as far as those orders delivering, inclusive of aftermarket, and all of the above. Um, so what we came to was a 12-vehicle uh, implementation of year one for 2022. Three of those vehicles, because of what's going on in our industry, are not even going to be arriving until 2023. And this is an issue that we're expecting to be dealing with potentially into 2024. How many vehicles until 2023? So we're, the initial order or recommendation would be 12, 12 vehicles, right. but there's three that we have to wait three. through 2023 right. model years right now. So again, being proactive now is going to be more important than we've ever seen. Um, but that being said, you're diving right into the 2022 highlighted portion. Um, Paul did us a great favor and dove into what the expected budget would have been, inclusive of highway, parks and rec, sewer, and then the town hall. And he, he came up to a $75,000 budget. Now that gives us a great look at the implementation as I alluded to when I, when I spoke with you all on the 14th of October. Um, this is a moving target and really this is proof of concept. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we're hitting the points that you all need and then we tailor that program accordingly. Uh, but what we came to, uh, if you can look at the far right column, is the net cost or revenue for the 2022 budget. What that does is it takes into account all of the lease structures from, those tw from the vehicles that will be implemented in the 2022 budget, exactly when they arrive, what the lease cost will be, and then the offset of the replacement vehicles being sold. So what would have been a $75,000 budget is reduced to $9,000. So we're looking at a $66,000 reduction of budget expense just in year one implementation. Now what we do is we'll take a look further into year 2023 and 2024. Now these are, again, these are not exactly accurate. Again, every year we take a look at it, we collect the data, that's a huge part of our program. You know, if something changes from year to year, we present that to your department heads and ultimately it is your decision. But again, hitting a moving target is what we do best. And presenting that data and collecting that data for you to make in the, uh, the best decision financially is, is, our, is our goal in its entirety. Um, going into year 2023, if you take a look at the same uh, kind of premise there, we have the vehicles that are showing up in year 2023 that we would be ordering, uh, hopefully this November, given the approval. 
with the arrival of those vehicles, the sale of those vehicles, and then including the lease payments from 2022, your net budget would be $24,000. Again, significant reduction if you were to carry that over from year one. So as we implement the program, the equity that you have in your fleet is something that we're going to be capitalizing and using to continuously drive down your overall costs. Uh, so this is a good idea of at least the year one vehicles and how we slowly implement that and then how we will work into the rest of your fleet accordingly. I know it's a tight numbers, but does anyone have any questions off the bat regarding how we came to these figures or how the implement implementation process would look? So, so according to this, in year 2024 would be the first year for this group of vehicles that would be paying the monthly lease with no offset for sales of vehicles for this group. Uh, the original plan obviously includes adding vehicles each year and there would be sales of those vehicles to generate revenue. And at the end of the five-year lease term, uh, the leased vehicles are actually sold and we're allowed to keep the proceeds. But I wanted to isolate the original 12 to see how it plays out because it, it really is an expense in 2024 and 2025. Yeah, $100,000. And Paul, that, given the vehicles initially implemented in 2021, that is correct. But what does need to be taken into account if everyone can flip to the, the last page of the analysis, what it will do is it will provide the full scope of, of how that will be implemented. So what is not included in 2024, which was embedded in the, in the original proposal, again, maybe it's off by a vehicle or two. Again, this is for, this is for proof of concept, but in year... Uh, 2024, we have estimated $142,000 of equity of selling those vehicles. So again, you, this is a great look at what the vehicles we implement over the first two years are. In 2024, there will be additional vehicles added, but there will be a significant number of vehicles that are going to be sold to help neutralize that cost. And you'll be able to see where that budget comes into play. Again, that's inclusive of operating costs, which we did not include in this budget, which is just from a purchasing standpoint. But again, operating newer, nicer vehicles, replacing on an earlier clip is going to sustainably drive down these expenses and something that you can proactively plan for in years to come. Yeah, it'll, it'll definitely drive down maintenance costs. Um, it's interesting because. Uh, what do you what do you what do you include in the maintenance costs? Because if they're only going to be five years old, what do you include in maintenance costs? Oil changes, tires. Yeah, that's a great question, Barry. The it's going to be preventative and non-preventative maintenance. And what we do is we calculate that based on what we see. We operate two million vehicles as a company, so we take the data and apply that to what we're structuring your leases on and structuring your program on. So, you know, if you have a vehicle that's operating maybe 5,000 miles a year, you're really not going to be looking at anything other than preventative maintenance. And that's part of what our program structure is. You're not letting vehicles surpass into the preventative maintenance or non-preventative maintenance, excuse me, which gets costly. You run into engine issues, belts, anything like that. Really, the whole idea is to be operating these on low mileage, filters, oil changes, tires, then we sell it for you. And you, you have the useful life of that vehicle. And because you buy vehicles so well as a government entity, we can sell them and the return is going to be very high and that's going to continue to drive down those costs. Right. And a key component that isn't really available to see right now too, but I think will be, we'll, what we feedback from our partners from a municipality standpoint is the, the work we've put into our technology. We put over $20 million in the last couple of years into our website, into the accessibility, and it really does reduce the administrative efforts from your department heads. So our job is to track and provide them with the data. Rec make the recommendations, give you exactly where your vehicles are, what they're costing from a cent down, down to every penny through the whole life of that vehicle. So really they have the educated decision made, a, made for them, and then you guys just determine what vehicles you actually want to execute. Well, I can see where this would really pay off with our lower mileage vehicles, which are all the town hall ones. Mm -hmm. But as you move in a couple of the sewer ones, but as you move into highway 
and highway, you're going to have high mileage. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, one question I didn't get answered last time was police vehicles. Yes. Why are we not looking at police vehicles? Because those are our ones are the highest mileage vehicles we own. I was going to ask that very question. They're so, 30, 30, 35,000 miles a year. That, that I would love to have that implemented too and show you guys the numbers behind. That's something where with the transition from the chief when I originally spoke with him, I, I started speaking uh, with Pat. That's how we initially got this conversation going and Mary. And then as we worked in, those were not included. So I would be happy to include those. We work with a, a ton of police departments across the state. And do you uh, do, do you do two year or three year terms with them? It's all depending on, on kind of because the, we can't keep them past three years, really. No, no, no. I, they're, they're, I can say know, we, we do have a few past three years, but we like to get rid of them. We would never recommend anything over three. So you're spot on with that. Any, some of them are two, but three is really the clip that we look for. Three to four, based on your mileage, probably be pushing it at four. But because of the amount of aftermarket that's going on these vehicles, you want to make sure that you're not depreciating it so quickly. That's going to be high upfront payments, right? So we want to make sure that we're stretching those payments out for three to four years. You're not seeing that, that cash flow hit up front, but you have the time to put yourself in a strong equity position upon sale. So when we have the aftermarket included, which we typically will capitalize into that lease, you're already right side up. So when we sell it, everything is good to go in that sense. And we know that the police officers are beating up those vehicles. You know, they're, they're driving much differently than any other department. So that's all taken into account, but we work again with a lot of police departments that have had success with the program. Can I because uh, I was going to say before Barry jumped in, and I'm glad you did with the police uh, <laughs> vehicles, which you brought up on October 14th. Um, Marty D'Ambrosia, East Rochester, Cosmo Junta, Gates. Uh, both are in your program. Marty Longer, I think some of the town board would know who Marty is. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have not gotten a chance to talk to either of them about their experiences, but let me ask you this. Both of them have police departments. Do they have their police cars in this uh, program? Gates does. Um, I do not believe that East Rochester is implemented yet. They, their implementation is very similar to what I'm proposing now uh, for the other departments. Um, that I have not, I'm not the account manager. So again, with what our teams have, it would be me supplying the plan, following with the plan. You also have a client strategy manager in a day-to-day -day context. You have a small team that works directly for you when it comes to your fleet. That just isn't my, my actual account. So I wouldn't know the specifics of that, but I'm sure Marty is happy to walk through any of those details. Well, I'd be interested to know, to see what you could provide just with respect to the police department. I'm not the liaison, but to me, it seems that if we're gonna do this on a time-wide basis, we should at least take a look at including the police department. I agree. The only thing, you, you can't compare East Rochester and what town of Webster. Mm -hmm. it, it's just not, you're looking at a very small area to cover yeah. compared to our area we cover. Gates might be closer. Right. Mm -hmm. It would be very similar. And, yeah. I, and I'd look at what their coverage is for turnaround on cars. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I would look at. I wouldn't look at East Rochester at all. Too small an area. I would agree with that. Just mm -hmm. a village. I would imagine the resale on police cars would be less because of the high mileage, high run time. Yeah, the engine's running all the time. Yeah, they never shut them off. Not showing mileage, but the engine's running. Yeah, I never understood that, though. Wow. I'm I am looking through the list here just to give you guys, I'm trying to pick from the references sheet here just to see what would be maybe the state some good members. police departments that may be more of a similar outreach. Um, I know we're working with city of Oneida. That's more of a Syracuse area. Um, could be obviously larger in a city, but the stretch of Webster being a larger town that might be more comparable. I want Fulton. You, you don't have the 2022 budget. No, uh, I didn't bring it. Yeah, it's okay. But I, I mean, I have some I'm sure that the, 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 there's, I don't know how many police three. cars we Barry's have budgeted in three. 2000. Three. We have three, three yeah, police three. cars that were budgeting in 2022. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. In that, the, which is. Two or three every year is pretty much yeah, right. what we do. We want, they always want to do three. They sometimes ask for four. Um, and do, but what? Do, we, do we know what? We know we have 37 in our fleet currently in all the other departments of cars and pickup truck. 
What do we have in the fleet for police cars? There's 12. Another dozen, right? Yeah. There's 12. Okay. Yeah. We're calling 50. And Tom, one nice piece I will add, since we've been work, I've been working with Paul and Tom, you know, making sure we're crunching the numbers properly and giving correct lead times. Police vehicles typically, so we're talking interceptors, the F-150 police responder. Um, these are vehicles that we typically have a longer order period. Yeah. Yep. So, and they're they're going now. They're getting away from that. They're going to the uh, SUVs. That, that's what I'm referring to as the interceptor. They don't even really do like you can do a Dodge Charger. We don't personally recommend those, especially in upstate New York. Yeah, the SUV is where we're kind of pushing everyone. I know that police departments are doing the same. So you're absolutely correct with that. Um, but again, given the opportunity to potentially add them, I know where we're at right now. Order banks are open for a short period of time. So again, this, mm -hmm. this availability, that's why we wanted to make sure we discuss and opened up any, for, to any questions, because given, you know, if this were to be moved forward with a, a vote from Wednesday, you know, we would want to make sure that we have quotes and orders ready to go yep. the following week, because being proactive, like I said, it's going to be vital to be able to get vehicles. Otherwise, you're stuck, you know, going to bid, going from dealership lots, which is going to skyrocket pricing. Right. But so from the police department themselves, that gives a little more leeway and timing. So, Paul, we, the 2022 budget right now for the four departments that we've been looking at all this stuff, $75,000 we have budgeted for purchases. Yes. Not including police. And police might be another uh, sixty another 90, grand? 90000 or so. Okay. <clears throat> well, I mean, if we're going to look at it in terms of. That may be something, I, it, it's probably too late to look at the police. What are your thoughts on that? Because you'd have to you'd have to be ordering them. To roll them now, later. I I will say working with you know I'm, there's a lot of the same upfitters that we're working with. So right now I'm working with some SUNY schools that are using UPD. Um, I'm still getting quotes finalized with our upfitters. So if we were to get the information, it would all depend on how quickly I could gather that fleet information. I get VIN's mileage and all the information I need to create my analysis. I can turn that around pretty quickly, okay. and then I, then, I then we can they implement should be able as to we provide that information to them. Yeah. Fairly quick. Well, I'm sure he can. <laughs> Probably off the top of his head. Yeah. Is there any reason that the police department has not been included in the discussions to date? Have they not no. expressed a desire or? They no. were offered an opportunity to be a part of the discussion, but they, they opted not to. Okay. So that's a discussion that probably needs to be had. That's news to me. Sure, That's news to me, too. Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to discuss what they wanted. Okay. You should at least get the information, in my opinion, and provide it. Oh, I agree. To the board. So we're, you can have a parallel discussion, I mm -hmm. guess, with, uh, with the chief. Well, the good news is, is the chief is, uh, you know, pretty financially savvy and he, he's to get us stuff so we could have the fleet. We might yeah, and if they chose to, and if they chose to opt out, you'd have the reason for it. I, this, I you're you're giving me information that I have not. Yeah, heard. I didn't know that. I I don't know if the opt out. And Josh, I don't want to sit here and do it. Who asked who to be in on the discussion? Was it just one of those things? I'm busy that day, or was it a true opt out? I want no part of this leasing. I sent the email to the department heads after we met with Connor. Um, I'd have to look if he actually emailed back no or if he just didn't respond, but I'm pretty sure it was a response that they weren't interested at the moment. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll follow up with Chief. Maybe there's yeah. more to the story. We figured they could always be added in later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, could, you could go to next year. With we're just checking yeah. it out. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it should, I don't think it should hold up what we're doing with this. No. I think we should another, at least get the opportunity to add analysis, uh, right? Tom, and then compare it. I reached out originally. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. Is it? No, I apologize. There was, Go ahead. I feel there was about four <laughs> conversations just going on there. there. I just want to, Patty, you said this police shouldn't hold up what we're doing here. Is that what I just heard you say? We can have the discussion with him, but I don't think it's going to change what we want to do with this, and it shouldn't okay. hold it up. And I and I think. Because we can There's go with theirs know about at this. any time. Is it one of the reasons why they're back here doing this presentation? Mm -hmm. 
is if the board showed that they have an appetite and they're, ex they're, they're, they're good with this and understand that we're, we're now going to enter into this and do the first phase in 2022, uh -huh. that probably would necessitate in three nights that we do a resolution to that uh, and also an authorization for the, you ready for the that? supervisor. Not quite yet. That's the question. Because in the presentation that cool. Jimmy and you gave to Paul and myself, so. and you'd be ordering these on Monday, November 22nd. That was a magical day for some reason. <laughs> That'll, we can That's absolutely cool. do that. Without, so we have all the quotes and everything prepared in our system. All I have to do is actually create the quotes, review specs, which we've discussed. But your department heads in each category will look through specs, aftermarket quotes, they'll be ready to sign. And as we yeah. discussed, the, I know that you have internally reviewed our contracts, um, I believe at some point, correct? This guy is not. Um, I will. I can resend those very easily. They're they're kind of oh, generic yeah. government contracts. Yeah, so if oh, yeah. the contracts. I sent them to Charlie, but he hasn't yeah. looked at them yet. Well, I feel better that you two review them more so than me. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that I was going to say is that I would not be comfortable with this endeavor until he said it was to a go. Yeah, I don't want to rush it. I would still. That's a lot of pressure you just put on him, Barry. He's uh, <laughs> he a. That's just, what he gets paid for. He just gave you the answer that he's not ready to do it. I would still, I still like to vet these lease costs. I mean, how does that compare to if we outright bought the vehicles and just financed them over five years? Is it comparable? I'd like to. Know and, that. and Connor, let me ask you this, and I, you know, and you I'm weren't take there, a but more time. Jimmy, yeah. when we were in here, November twenty second, the magical day, <laughs> right? We were kind of building this all around. If we don't do this in order by November 22nd, does the sky fall and the world ends, or? I would sure hope not. Okay. <laughs> but, um, the, we're setting time frames in which we think we need to hit to get your orders in. Now, I'm, I'm, we bring this up, and me and Jimmy met on the side, because manufacturers are not operating as they have. Right. The cutoffs are right. happening overnight. So yep. there's been multiple government <laughs> entities where, you know, for example, the, uh, the Chrysler uh, Voyager, the new minivans. You know, we have government municipalities that are ordering tons of those as passenger vehicles cut off overnight, and they won't accept orders. So to prevent that, we want to make sure that everything, our ducks in a row, everything's signed for, we have everything internally discussed and gone over that we need to. So when that time comes, we can submit orders, and then you guys are in the clear. Because then we're right. looking at different manufacturers are going to open for 2023, then we're going to be looking to get you guys stock vehicles, which is going to be more expensive. Again, this, you know, the program itself is really uh, holistically. Again, to answer your Paul or answer your question, Paul, you could go to a, you could go finance it. You could go for bid and finance it. The same structure we're doing, but you will not be able to sell the vehicles as well as we do, just given our footprint. And what goes along with that is a holistic approach. We're capturing data for you, removing the administrative efforts. And we're really just laying it out for your department heads to make the decision. So yeah. as a whole program, from safety standpoint, the whole nine yards, I know that's something that can't be, re can't be replicated. Right. I, I, I will tell you this. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of can get, like, read the tea leaves here is that we're not going to be doing a resolution on the 18th, uh, three days from now. We're not going to be ordering on the 22nd. With that being said, okay. I, I totally agree with Barry that, you kind of rule the roost here, and mm -hmm. we bounce some ideas off each other, like comparing it against buying, mm -hmm. comparing it against this, taking the the resale value that Enterprise is saying, and what happens if we back that off by 25%, by 50%? You right. know, does it still make sense mm -hmm. over you know 10 years? All this there's there's a lot of variables that you could do in comparison that'll probably get you more comfortable in consulting the board on. Mm -hmm. Jeez, this seems like a good idea. I personally want to talk to Marty, not so much because East Rochester is comparable, um, but Marty, at the times I've talked to him, seems like a pretty sharp guy. And so I want to see what his experience has been. What, did, what, what was it about it that was what he didn't expect or whatever? Certainly Cosmo, uh, mm -hmm. that entity, uh, size-wise and probably fleet-wise, matches us more. And I don't know if they're one year into it or if they're five years into it and this is something that a senior did, you know. So there's some more due diligence we have to do, but we're going to hit a point where we're going to have to order the budgeted cars police-wise and, uh, yeah. uh, 
you know, the other departments, mm -hmm. uh, the 75,000 in the other departments. And it might just be that they just, we run out of time from a standpoint of, especially with the lead times, the supply chain thing. Well, right. I mean, there know, was, if, there if, was, if, if you, if we buy one of these cars that we had in the 2022 budget, uh, just like Connor's saying, even when he goes to order the lease, some of these we're, we're not going to get till June or September of 22, which is right. crazy to me, but that's the world we live in right there now. There was times when, yeah. when, when, in my previous life, when the, as soon as the budget was okayed, there was things that I ordered yeah. that week. And when did you get them? Sometimes not till August, sometimes July. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, trucks, yeah. tr vehicles themselves yeah. weren't too bad. But like backhoes and that kind of stuff, you were really going out I there. And that that now it's got to be a lot worse. Oh, it's terrible. Well, any heavy duty like you're referring to in machinery, that's, that's, I mean, they were ordering 2023s for freight liners. Right. Three, four months ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, they've really, really changed the dynamic. And I totally appreciate where you're coming from, from diving into the financial aspect. One thing I will tell you is you, you will find, let's say, let's reduce the equity out of it, right? Let's say you, you mimic our program and let's completely remove that. That leaves you with $230,000 of savings over that 10 year period rather than the 800. And that's removing any type of equity applied because we're operating newer, nicer vehicles. When you add our ability to sell those vehicles, that's really where we're going to continue to push that forward. So I am very confident. Can I make a suggestion? And I mean, I hate to, you know, uh, we have a workshop, I think, tentatively scheduled for Thursday, December 9th. Some of these things, Paul, you and I can get together and start doing a little due diligence, work yeah. with Jimmy and Connor, maybe talk to the police chief. Why weren't you interested? Was it a misunderstanding? Mm -hmm. Would you, you know, help us at least take a look at this? Mm -hmm. A lot of things that we can do that could maybe dovetail to having you back. I mean, we don't want to drag you. It is a big decision. Oh, for sure. You know, this is, this is a big decision, and we want to... I know you're getting sick and tired of hearing me say this. We want to measure twice, cut once on this. This one sounds like you might want to measure four times. Yes. You know, I can and, appreciate uh, that. And for lack of better terms, you know, we, that's why we, you know, we'll date before we get married. We implement slowly to your needs, and <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's the goal here. So we want to make sure that you're comfortable and that it all makes sense. Yeah. And, I mean, actually, it's funny because, Bill, you bring up a great point about East Rosser. Enterprise is a huge organization. There's probably within 100 miles of here other municipalities that are the size of Webster that you could, we could go and get a reference on 100%. what their experience has been with you. Finding out if they started a couple of years ago with a fleet of 40 and now they're you know, 20 into it or 30 into it. I think we could get some more information that would uh, you know, kind of assuage the accountant in us uh, yeah. all. Uh, yeah, it's a big number. Uh, Connor, if you can send me, I think you said the, the pricing is through SourceWell? Yes. Yeah. So it's the structure of that? Send me the documentation for that. 100%. Yeah. So that's a cooperative bid group that we're allowed to buy now, through. Another point so. is the RFP, so we were awarded that at best value, I think it was four years ago. That's rolling into the end of 2021. So we'll just it'll just go up for bid again, and it'll go out to RFP. And given the government sector, that's something that we've kind of We've tailored our program too. So, from a competition level or an RFP standpoint, enterprise is really the ones that dove in and kind of modeled our, yeah. our system around the government entity. But the current piggyback language is for 2021. So, again, we're we're good with December. <laughs> if uh, you need me to come back then, totally understand. And I mean, it, this is kind of one of those things where you know the you only have to do what you have to do, and I totally respect that. But I'll try to call forward and see if they can give us another month. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> No, thank you all. I right. appreciate the time. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Connor. We thank you. Some thank you, Connor. Mm -hmm. We call on Chief in the morning. Oh, the Chief. Town of, town of Seneca Falls is also listed here. Oh, yeah, is. that might be close. Do you think they're really big of this? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? I thought that was the, the town from uh, It's a Wonderful Life. It is. And they're big, mm -hmm. as big as us. Well, oh, they're acreage wise. You can yeah. also uh, you can always look it up. <laughs> hey, you know, watch it, though. I know you're a short timer, all right? But that's not get too cocky, Barry. <laughs> well, Brayton, we end with. Uh, boy, I'll tell you. He's got 15 minutes, right? <laughs> I don't know if he. Well. Yeah, nice go car. Can you talk as fast as the marijuana salesman? I make uh, no analogies to myself and marijuana salesman. 
Shall I begin? <laughs> Let it fly. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Uh, the agenda item is um, OSHA ETS, which is Emergency Temporary Standard. Uh, this is what you have probably um, read about or seen uh, in the news. Uh, the federal government, uh, through the authority of OSHA, is requiring all businesses uh, with over 100 employees to implement um, certain vaccine and or uh, testing and mask procedures. Uh, this does apply to the town of Webster because New York State is a state plan uh, s participant under OSHA. And so we are regulated by PESH, which is a New York State agency, but uh, the same requirements do come to us, uh, which I will be honest is not what I initially thought when the president uh, announced this uh, a number of months ago. Um, so I guess uh, some of the things are, what is uh, what are policy choices that the town board has versus what is mandatory under the legislation? Or not, it's not legislation, it's emergency temporary standard. Um, so what is mandatory under it is certain things have to be implemented by December 6th which as we all know is not very far away. Um, the town has to adopt a vaccination policy that complies with the OSHA ETS. The town has to determine the vaccination status of each and every employee, obtain acceptable proof of vaccination and maintain records and a roster of vaccinated uh, status. Uh, we have to provide support for vaccination uh, we have to require employees to promptly provide us notice of positive COVID-19 test or COVID diagnosis. Um, we have to remove any employee who receives a positive test or diagnosis from the workplace for purposes of workplace safety. Um, ensure that any employee who is not fully vaccinated wear face mask coverings when indoors or in a vehicle with, a, with another person. Um, we, there's certain mandatory notifications and documents that we have to provide to every employee about the ETS, about their rights under it, and our, whatever our policy is that we end up adopting. Um, and there are certain OSHA requirements we have to meet. So for instance, if someone had a work-related COVID-19 fatality, we would have to report to OSHA within eight hours. Uh, and if there were somebody hospitalized, we would have to report to OSHA within 24 hours if it's work-related. Um, there's certain records that we would have to provide within four hours to OSHA if they were to make the request to us, all kinds of uh, good stuff there. Um, by January 4th, uh, the town has to, uh, as an employer, uh, ensure that those who are not fully vaccinated, if they're in the workplace, that they have to be tested at least weekly and that they have to wear face coverings anytime they're in the workplace. Um, all right, so policy choices that the town has. Uh, the first is that uh, employers can adopt either a mandatory uh, vaccine policy that says everybody has to be vaccinated um, with the exception of reasonable accommodations under either the ADA or um, religious um, uh, based accommodations. Or the town can adopt a, a policy that allows for uh, weekly testing and mask wearing for those who are not vaccinated. So that's kind of the biggest policy choice uh, that the town has. Other policy issues are um, if the town adopts uh, t uh, weekly testing and mask wearing, um, you know, what is the town's role as an employer versus the employee's responsibility when it comes to obtaining those tests? paying for those tests, um, and is it done on their time or on work time? Uh, other things that would have to be in the policy that the town will have to make decisions on are what happens when an employee is non-compliant with the requirements. Um, you know, are they uh, unpaid, suspended? Are they, you know, given warnings? Um, you know, are they terminated? Things like that. Um, and um, un the last factor is uh, not so much a decision, but it is uh, the intention of OSHA and their statement is that their ETS supersedes all local and state laws on the subject. And that um, 
-hmm. Essentially, if you're in a collective bargaining arrangement, where we have unions, right, and, and uh, there are certain rights and obligations under the law, um, but this, uh, this has to be implemented. And so the question would be is, while doing the implementation, you know, a union might, uh, uh, a union in New York State would have the right to bargain the impact of that implementation. Okay, so they would not have the right to uh, interfere with the policy decision of implementing it, but they would have a right to uh, negotiate the impact of that. Um, again, the key dates are December 6th and January 4th. Um, the, the penalties are the OSHA penalties of uh, 13000 uh, and change dollars for each occurrence and up to $136,000 for willful noncompliance. Um, there's also a penalty for employees who uh, provide false information. So if an employee were to give a false test or a, or a uh, false uh, vaccination record, um, though there, that's, I believe that's a criminal penalty. Um, and we're required to notify the employees given that information. Uh, about that so that they, you know, make uh, informed decision about its compliance. Um, OSHA website does have model policies that um, two of them, one for the vaccine <coughs> mandate uh, path and the other for the, um, the weekly testing mask wearing alternative uh, that we can use as a basis so that any policy that the town does adopt is compliant with the requirements. And they also have all the mandatory um, educational material that we're required to give to employees. And they have um, actually a quite detailed FAQ on, uh, on questions that, um, that I spent uh, a decent amount of time reading because there's a myriad of questions whenever there's a new mandate. Um, what is the status of the OSHA uh, ETS? Um, so uh, you may have seen that uh, federal court panel uh, out of, I believe, Louisiana. The Fifth Circuit. Thank you. Yeah, it sits in, it sits in New Orleans. Yeah. Yep. Um, has uh, put a, a stay. Um, I don't. I think that's a correct term. Might be a temporary restraining order. I would defer to uh, any stay. lawyer because I'm not a lawyer. Um, and uh, but there is legal. Uh, there's going to be legal action in multiple uh, federal uh, jurisdictions in yes. different courts across the country, and that'll probably get consolidated, and there'll probably be appeals, and you know, so, so maybe my it's question, going to the my, Supreme my, Court. My, my question, I apologize for interrupting. Yeah, go ahead, um, I'm almost done. But I, I've read through this, and you know, my opinion of this is wholly unconstitutional. In a number of states, attorney generals have filed, because it is, in their interpretation, whole, wholly and significantly unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So I guess, because of the, the Fifth Circuit has issued a stay, why would the town of Webster consider implementing policies that I believe 27 states attorney generals have determined is unconstitutional? I think ultimately that answer is for the town board. Um, my uh, perspective on it is from uh, the responsibility that I would have to implement. And uh, so if the stay were overturned, uh, you know, and we hadn't begun the work of preparing a policy and also the work of informing employees and collecting the vaccination records, then um, we would absolutely end up out of compliance. Uh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I mean, that's the essence of the ETS, the emergency. They say, uh, you know, you got 60 days to get the whole testing in, 30 days to get all the documentation in line. Um, you know, I'm not thrilled by that, uh, so that's a understatement. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it's at least, and, and uh, Charlie, please weigh in, but I think. Oh, I've got plenty of questions. Oh, right. I think. On the federal court jurisdiction, yeah. whether that stay applies only to the states that are covered by that court, or does it apply to the whole country? 
Um, it was my understanding that it only applied to states Generally, that, that are covered apply, by that, it would that only area. It to that circuit, but it depends on what, the, what I haven't read the decision. Yeah. Yes, our circuit is the second circuit, covers Connecticut, New York State, Puerto Rico, and maybe one other state. I can't remember. Maybe it's Vermont, um, I think. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, it's a big deal because it's covered, you know, it's New York City, there's an awful lot of litigation in, in, uh, in New York. And also, I think we can reasonably expect that it's unlikely that our Attorney General or the Attorney General of Connecticut, both of which are very liberal states are going to be bringing a, a constitutional provision. So this is hopefully going to get fast-tracked to the Supreme Court. Hopefully. It, my question is this. It's temporary. Um, we don't know when it ends. Does it have an end date? Or is it similar to, month, right? to Cuomo's per, permanent <laughs> emergency orders, which are supposed to be 30 days at a time, but the legislature allowed him to continue and continue? And I, that, that you may not be able to answer that question. I'm not well, trying I, to I, I have an answer. I'm just trying to re resist all that uh, cheese you're leaving for me. Um, the, uh, the OSHA FAQs say that uh, it's for at least six months, you know, but that they'll be evaluating and stuff. So it's not a promise to only go six months, but it's at least six months. So it's, and who, it, it, I think this is somewhat analogous to our emergency orders that we had from the governor. Those EOs that kept on coming and coming, and, but they were, yes. of course, approved by the state legislature. In this case, it's an agency. They are making rules, but they have the, apparently, apparently have the effect of law, but yeah. they're not actually legislation, correct? Um, I mean, as far as Yeah, you know, I mean, so we're, we're going to get into uh, an, an area where my knowledge gets uh, shallow, but it's my understanding that the uh, regulatory schema uh, that they decided to pursue is that Congress did authorize in law OSHA to make emergency measures, right, uh, that could basically go, go into implementation much faster than the normal regulatory process, which is you'd publish something and there'd be months and months of comment and review and revision and, you know, uh, usually the regulatory process goes very slowly so that everything is heard. Uh, and, so, but so, there's so they abdicated their responsibility track. by handing it over to unelected bureaucrats is basically Political what happened. Political workaround is what yeah, it is. That's my opinion, but, uh, but I know that it makes it problematic because then it's, hard, it's harder to attack because who do you go after? You know, you can't, yeah. you go after OSHA and, and really you have to rely on, on people like the various attorneys general or other, other litigators to bring these, uh, bring these proceedings in federal court. Because yeah, it it's federal. You, you really, this, this would bypass state court, so you have to bring it in federal court. And uh, as was done down in Louisiana, it has to, would have to be brought in fast track to the circuit courts. So the circuit courts are sort of the appellate divisions of the federal system. Yeah. And, um, and it, it puts, um, you know, it puts the town in a very difficult position. Sure. Um, you know, you, you're the policy deciders on that as the town board. Um, you know, I just, my perspective is it puts uh, the, the, the department heads, uh, you know, in a very difficult position because, um, you know, they have an obligation to follow uh, workplace safety regulations. There's nothing new about that. Um, you know, there's, they, they always have that obligation. It's just the uh, federal government is, using those existing regulations in a way that they haven't before. Um, you know, so I, I mentioned the, the penalties uh, and, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's risk of private action, you know, from somebody who could be, you know, I don't know, catches COVID and says they caught it because we, uh, as an employer, failed to follow. Um, or someone uh, could sue the town measure. because their vaccination well, there, status there's, is, yeah, there's is, is, just, is, is not for just opens it general up to consumption. Period. All sorts of yeah. you know, litigation, like, to me, potential it's, abuse. Yeah, it's, it's to terrible. Me it sounds like that uh, we should prepare for the worst mm -hmm. and hope for the best. Be prepared, to get the policies in place, and. When we are told we absolutely have to implement them or be under penalty, then that would be the time we would, but yeah. not until. I mean, by that time, if we're prepared 
and all the things you suggested we do choose which policies we want to choose uh, notification to all the all the employees and the department heads of the coming the possibility of coming uh, procedures that are going to be implemented if we get that all done and wait to find out what jurisdictions we're under then then we're prepared um, I don't agree with it John any more than you do but I'm also not prepared, I also would not be prepared to put the town in a position where we would be responsible for lack of implementation of laws that are being forced upon us um, and be responsible for the penalties that might be incurred if we don't do it. I mean, uh, it, it's just, you know. It's we, got, we got 13 days to have it completed, December 6th. The first yeah, part. It's not a lot of time. The first and, part. And, and as Braden is, is emphasized, thank you, by the way. It's a good thank you for your presentation. Thank you for this. But it, it, we are a OSHA approved state plan or under an OSHA approved state plan, which means we are well, we, have to, we have to comply with this. Right. Yeah. And, well, and we're put under this under this horrific time burden and potential loss of funding and God knows what other sanctions they could apply against the town. The good news is that Councilman Abbott is a very good engineer, maybe not a good mathematician. It's about 21 days, I think. Uh, December 6th days. versus, oh. Well, then you are a good mathematician. Uh, the bad news is I, I would imagine we would have to adopt this at the Thursday, December 2nd board meeting. Yeah. Um, Barry, so you long. said it it's perfect. So I couldn't have said it any better than you said it, so I'm not gonna be redundant to what he said. Braden. Charlie, would it be in our best interest we draft something that we're ready to adopt on December 6th? So what, what Barry said, I hope in this fluid nature of what's going on, how many days between now and, would you say, January 4th? That Jan January 4th some, is the testing requirement. January right. comes in, but we got to have this passed. And I would just say, uh, and, and I'm with... Uh, Barry and John, I just, I just can't believe that this, this is where we're at. Um, but it is what it is, and I think we would, uh, well, Barry said it all. We can't, we can't thumb our nose at it. So, Brayden, I know you and I have talked about this. Um, if you remember when you came to me a week and a half ago and presented it, um, my face turned green. I really, honestly, I wanted to throw up. I'm like, you got to be kidding me that we're, we're going to be going down this path. Um, well, what, at what point does the general population or this town board, at what point do we say no, okay? At some point, and you can look at industries out there, that this mandate has been forced upon, are saying no. The pushback is nationwide. So at what point, and it's a question, at what point? is enough enough with COVID and the push for these vaccinations. I couldn't, okay? agree, I couldn't agree with you more, but the people that are pushing back aren't public entities, aren't, aren't government entities. Yes. I understand that, but they're individuals and they are people. That's where I'm coming from right now, okay? And we represent these people and these unions. If you and I owned the town of Webster, we could make that decision on how we felt about this, but we don't. Okay. We work for the we work for the residents of the town of Webster, and what what kind of responsibility are, are we're responsible for this? And it's not good. It's no, not good. It, it is not good, and it's unconstitutional. And hopefully, in the very near future, somebody will step forward and say, "There's a permanent stay on this for the for the entire nation." Yeah. And but until people, that time, we need, will stand we up need and say to be this prepared. is unconstitutional, and we don't want this these policies put forward. Okay. Well, and, but I agree with Barry. We can say that and we can take that stance, but as town officials, we have to be prepared for it. We don't want to be in a position that we may not agree with it. We might not do anything, and then we get a fine for thirty thousand dollars. I'm not going to pay that fine. No. no. And, and or, yeah. or, one of our employees passes away from COVID, or gets. Permanent 
whatever from COVID and we haven't followed the rules. <clears throat> and then we're responsible for that. Well, there, there would have to be a connection, but yes, you're, you're all right. The, the bottom line is, and you've all heard this phrase from the time you were kids, hopefully, um, we're a nation of laws and uh, as imperfect as this is, and it's a really a regulation rather than a law, but it has the effect of law and the force of law, we've got to follow it. Oh. We have a responsibility, I guess, to implement a policy, whether we like it or not. And uh, we have other remedies, I guess, uh, legally and politically. Well, and, I mean, well, we're going to have to face the fact that there may be some of our employees are going to say, "I'm not going to comply with yes. this," and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to leave. And God bless them. It, you know, it's happening all across the country. People are doing yes, it everywhere. It where they're taking, making that stand. Um, Barry, to your point, I uh, I was with a couple of couples a few weekends ago that work for some major corporations that have you know thirty thousand people worldwide, and those corporations are flexing their muscles and not giving any latitude to weekly tests and masking. They're just saying if you're not vaccinated by this certain date, you're fired. Mm -hmm. We've seen it with the hospital systems. Mm -hmm. We've seen it, and that's private industry. I, I know that, Braden, you and I talked about, there's latitude in this. You, you mentioned a few of the things. Uh, that when you first brought it up to me, I thought it was going to have to be daily testing for the non-vaccinated, which was like, oh, my God, how do we? But now you, you said I think it's weekly. Yep, every so seven days. So we need to take a look at this and come up with the policy that the board will be voting on on December 2nd. And uh, I know this, I would not advocate for, you know, something very draconian where, yeah, if you don't, if you're not vaccinated on January 4th, you're fired. We'll try to give as much latitude on this with the hope that common sense prevails in a stay or a, you know, whatever. We never have to implement it on January 4th. But is there, is there the, anywhere the in that that allows for religious exemptions? Yes, you said yes. it was. Okay, yes. I just want to confirm that, all right? Yeah. And I would hope that this town board would consider utilizing for our employees the religious exemption. And That's uh, up to the individual. The OSHA FAQs I'm um, saying that. have specific links to the EEOC's guidance on religious exemptions. Um, and I think, though, that the religious exemption would mainly be, would be, most pertinent if the town adopted the 100% vaccine mandate, uh, because I think that the most reasonable accommodation is weekly testing and mask wearing. I do too. Um, which if the town adopted that policy, um, you know, the, that, would, that would be most often the case, but every single case is unique and uh, every case has to be weighed in uh, with what that person's rights are and what, uh, what the accommodation requested is, and if it's reasonable to the operation and to the safety of employees. So Braden, as we're putting this together in the next however many day, calendar days, business days, mm -hmm. dovetailing to December 2nd, yeah. and I don't want the town board to have their first glimpse of the proposed uh, policy on December 2nd. Um, I wouldn't think that would make a good policy. Yeah. Um, are, are we going to, I mean, obviously we, we need to see where the unions stand on this. I mean, are, um, you know, I don't, I don't think, to be honest with you, if this is required, it almost doesn't matter what the unions think. Right. Yeah, the, the, it's, um, so sometimes you have Good. to negotiate yes. something with, with a union before you implement it. Yeah. Okay. Particularly if there's something in a contract that, you know, has been previously agreed to, right? Uh, or... You can't just change these things. But, um, you know, I, I haven't found any provisions in the contracts yet that uh, address this situation. Um, not, there, of course, there'd be nothing about COVID, but, you know, um, and, and pub, public, public health emergencies are, are, you know, well over 100 years old, right? Uh, or maybe, maybe they're since the beginning of time. Uh, but what would be the negotiation, what would be with the, new, the union is we'd say, look, uh, this is what the uh, intended plan is, or this is what the policy that the town board's adopted. And the union would say, okay, but what about if an employee 
this happens to them, how are you going to handle it? And then we would uh, in, have negotiations, small N, not capital N, yeah. which are essentially that, that um, you know, you should be working with your labor partners and come up with rules that make sense and that are fair. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's small end negotiation, if there, if you come, if you can't have a meeting of the minds, the town still implements. Whereas if there was a, um, if, if there was a provision in the contract that already existed and we were engaged in capital end negotiations, when the parties don't agree, then it goes to arbitration yeah. and you don't implement until after that's resolved. Oh. And that's layman term to what you just said. Uh, in a lot of ways, on the small end, you know what, Union, um, the federal government wins on this one, not you. <laughs> the town has to really, mm -hmm. you know, pay attention to that. And well, it's not a matter you know, of winning. And, and well, you know what I mean. I know what I mean, you it's, mean. It's, it's, and, and, and it's a lose-lose. Lose. This uh, whole thing is a lose-lose situation for everyone. There's only so much discretion. You know, the discretion is mainly around... Um, uh, what happens when somebody's non-compliant, uh, and and uh, how are you going to, um, you know, who's going to be responsible, right? Is the town of Webster going to set up a health clinic uh, and uh, you know have a nurse on call to take everyone's COVID test? That won't be my suggestion. No. But if we were a massive industry that could not afford to risk losing a single person, then having an occupational health uh, on facility set up like that might be a really good business decision. Yeah, it's not for the town. You got all the full-time employees, union employees, non-union employees, also the permanent part-time, this is effects, seasonal part-time. Yes, um, yes, it's, so it's all, it's the, the OSHA, uh, did not make the count based on full-time versus part-time. So it's all employees, um, and it's basically anybody employed, okay? So it's your planning board, zoning board, conservation board members. Um, you know, it is uh, all the people who work at the rec department. So, you know, with all of our par uh, seasonals, we have 370 people yeah. that we have to know the vaccination status of. And then whatever percentage of them, uh, I don't know, I think maybe the population in this county is like 70% fully vaccinated, maybe. Maybe we replicate that. Uh, and so then that's tracking, um, well, what's 30% of 370, about 100. 110. What is it actually, Paul? You didn't know I was gonna ask him to play card tricks. It's actually 111, but who's- There you no, go, that's not split 111. Hairs. So then uh, every week we're tracking uh, records for 111 people and their medical records. So, um, you know, due care is required. Yeah. Who would be doing that? <laughs> You're looking at him. <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, yes, uh, with a, uh, I, I'm, pro I'm thinking of a decentralized model where department heads are, res are the first line of responsibility for their workforce. Well, you may get some pushback on that because I don't know if every department head in this in, in the town of Webster is going to be comfortable going to their individual employees and asking them what their vaccination status is because it's, in my opinion, it's none of their business. Uh, um, yeah, that could definitely happen. From a uh, HR standpoint, it's not dissimilar to any time we ask somebody for a doctor's note for an absence. Right, you give that to your direct oh. supervisor slash department head, yeah, then it gets filed in the HR department in a uh, separate medical file under lock and key. Same thing here, um, no. in one sense. In one sense, something completely different. Yeah, I, w I would disagree with that analogy. Yeah. And that's fair. Yes. Well, I mean, unless I mean. You, we, we don't will, have a choice. We have right. To have a we'll work on, place. we'll have something, and you won't see it the first time on December 2nd. I think I know how everybody feels. We're, we're, we'll try to make it as manageable and uh, whatever is possible within the you know, scope of this law 
And uh, Barry, you said it best. We, we, all, we hope we're just checking a box and that common sense prevails and we never have to implement this on January 4th. Hopefully. And if we do, aren't you glad you retired? <laughs> no, it'll still make a difference to me. I know. Um, we live in interesting times, that's for certain. We live in interesting times. Typical of the federal government. Well, and you know, it's typical of the government that's running this right now, Bill, that's for sure. Bill, did you watch the October 28th uh, tape on the public meeting with Sandbar Park? No, I have not yet seen that. Okay. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but one of the people that said, and I'm, you know, why don't you town board members or whatever uh, get some guts and tell New York State to go rub rock salt? All right? And they got a lot of cheers. Well, the town board really should not be telling the state government and the federal government to go rub rock salt because where we might feel good about that, we just did a total disservice to the community. Yep. Because there will be ramifications for that. Because they hold the cards. And it's not just $13,000 fines. No. I feel very confident about that. That those federal government agencies interact and, you know, you. I was in the mortgage business. Let me tell you something. We'd get people applying for FHA loans. Everybody knows about those? And all of a sudden they say, nope, you reneged on a student loan 19 years ago that was backed by the federal government. Out. That's true. Happen all the time. I don't want the town to get the scarlet letter of being the one who reneged on the student loan 19 years ago when we go to get maybe a grant or something like, are you kidding me? You're a pariah as far as we're concerned, town of Webster. If we That's get, serious. If we get the we scarlet letter instead that. of a red A, can we get a red W? <laughs> well, I guess that might end the meeting. Yeah? <laughs>